All right, uh, grab your Bibles, grab your notes, your pens, get ready to write this morning just a few things down. Uh, some of you remember that we've been in a series that we, we call this Fear Less, the series. Now, real quick, I ask this every, every message at the very beginning, how many of you would like to have a little less fear in your life? Absolutely. That's probably every single one of us in here. Less fear would be better, but today I'm actually going to ask you to have more fear. Yeah, I'm kind of switching it up on you a little bit. Certainly we all want less fear, but today I'm going to ask you to fear something a little bit more. I'll explain to you what I mean here in just a second. I was, uh, I was told that there was this one little boy who uh, uh, got sick, uh, had the strep throat, and his mom said, well, you can't come to church now. Uh, because you do have strep throat, you need to stay home. So he stayed home in bed. As soon as church was over, all the rest of the family came back home. His mom said to the rest of the family, he said, well, how did church go today? And they said, it was a great day at church. It was Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday is where they wave palm branches when Jesus enters into the town. And the little boy heard that, and he immediately said, oh, great, the one day I'm sick, and Jesus actually shows up. Today, 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 I want to ask you something very similar. What if Jesus showed up in your life? What would it do to you? Today, I'm talking about the fear of the Lord and the power of the fear of the Lord in your life, what that means, what that does to you and I, to each one of us, when we suddenly have the fear of the Lord. Let's pray. Father... We ask this morning that, that you would, you would open our eyes, that we could see you, we can know you, that we would tremble in your presence, we could experience who you really are, and not just our small concept of you. Now, Father, today we ask in a weird sort of way that you would wreck our world of all the things that it shouldn't be, only to be replaced by yourself and all that you are. Now, we ask you to change us. Have your way with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, let, me, let me say this, okay? Rarely do I do this, but on this message, I, want, I almost feel like I need to give you a warning in advance, okay? And the warning is, is simply this. Uh, if this, what we're talking about this morning, really, really sinks in, it does have the possibility to obliterate your life as you know it, uh, uh, to completely transform and change it. Uh, today, we're talking about going from a concept to a reality, and I would suspect, I would suspect that there might be even a large number of people in here who would choose the concept over the reality because the reality changes everything. Concept is neat and it's, 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 it's easy and it fits kind of neatly into your clean uh, life. Your reality is something far more. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the fear of the Lord. You see, so many, so many uh, Christians, I, I, I would say, have a concept of God rather than the reality of God. In fact, I, w I would almost ask you to ask yourself, was there that moment, was there that time, can I point to that place where where? The concept became reality. Last night at family church, I, I, I asked uh, families to get together, and, and I'll kind of ask you to do the same here this morning, but to find, I asked them to get together and come up with a definition for the fear of the Lord, and, and uh, got a lot of great answers. Uh, one family, they said the fear of the Lord is being awed by God. Great answer, absolutely. 
Another family said it's admiration of God, absolutely. Another family said it was, it's the law of God. Yeah, sure. Um, and on and on, all these different, what, what would your definition be maybe? Uh, you can kind of think of that or maybe write it on your paper. But, but I say the fear of the Lord. What is your definition? My definition, it was simply this. The fear of God, the fear of the Lord is that moment that God becomes real rather than just a concept in your life. That moment that God becomes real rather than just a concept. And those two things are radically different. In America, there are a lot of us who have the concept. And I would suggest probably fewer of us who have the reality. The reality will shake you. The reality of God will cause you to tremble. The reality of God changes everything about your life as you know it. And that's what we're going to look at here this morning. And so as we go through this, you'll be able to answer concept or reality for me. What is it? What, do I, what, what, what is this for me, the fear of the Lord in my life? Uh, a little while back, in fact, the last time I went to India, I, I went to uh, the northern part of India as well, way up north, uh, in, a, in a town called Lucknow. Uh, Lucknow, when I got there, uh, I came to discover it's not very far at all from Nepal. And um, the folks who were living there in Lucknow, they began to describe for me the earthquake that had just happened in Nepal. And it was so close that they too felt the impact of the earthquake. They could feel it. And some of you remember watching the news and you saw what the earthquake did and the devastation and, and the homes that fell in and, and just uh, how amazing uh, it just completely changed those folks there in their, in, in their life there in Nepal. That's what that earthquake did. It shook it violently. And those in luck now were describing to me what happened to them that night, and they were all asleep in their beds, and suddenly they felt the shaking, and everybody instantly tried to do the best they could to run out into the courtyard because there was an open space, and, and they weren't in as much danger of the, the buildings falling in on them. And they described that there were tremors and aftershocks ongoing, and they would stay there in the center and just feel these tremors and these aftershocks. They described for me what it was like to live in a place where this earthquake was going on, what, what was happening. Now, please understand, they experienced the reality of an earthquake. I only had the concept. Do I know what an earthquake is, you ask? Absolutely, I know what an earthquake is. I've, I've, I've heard about earthquakes. I've watched on TV earthquakes. I, I've seen pictures of devastation of earthquakes. I've even heard from people who have been in earthquakes about earthquakes. And so, but still, I've never experienced for myself the earthquake. I have a concept of an earthquake, not the reality. In the same way, do you have a concept of God or the reality of God? It's interesting because we, we have a man here who, who suddenly experienced the reality of God. And we see the impact it had on his life. We see what it did to him. And I would suggest the same thing would happen to you and I if he showed up at church today. The book of Isaiah, Isaiah talks about this prophet Isaiah and who he is and what it's really all about and what's going on. But, but let me just kind of give you a little bit of background. Isaiah was, according to Jewish tradition, known to be a, a, of, of royalty. Uh, he was a, a, in the elite class. He was, he was very learned. Uh, he was very skilled. Uh, some go on to say that he was a genius of that day and that time. Uh, this, this was Isaiah. He was uh, especially skilled in communication, oral communication, which was very, very important then and, and would put somebody in a very, very high level. So this is the guy that we're talking about. And it says here that it's in the days or when, when Uzziah, the king Uzziah, died. Now, let me, let me just real quick say what, what's going on there. The king Uzziah was a king who had leprosy. And as a result, he was closed off for a long time from all the people. And what happened then as a result is the kingdom was in shambles. 
Uh, politically, it was in a mess. It was in a lot of upheaval. There were no good leaders at the time. It was really a disaster what was going on in that nation. And here comes Isaiah, and he is one of those guys who's talking about it, and they're working on this, and how can we change things? How can we fix things in our nation? And then God steps in. And then God steps in. Then God chooses to move. Then God chooses. It's then that God chooses to do something. And this is what he does. Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord, he says. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. Let me just pause right there for a second, okay? Because I don't want you to miss how important this is, what they're saying. They said, holy, holy, holy. To us, it just sounds like they're repeating themselves. But, but you need to understand in Hebrew, if something is, is needed emphasis, they repeat it. If they're wanting to give emphasis to something, they, they say it a second time. That, that's how it's written in Hebrew. It doesn't necessarily translate always that way to us. For instance, uh, there's a place in Scripture where, where um, uh, our translation reads the finest of gold. In Hebrew, it simply says gold, gold. Okay? And gold, gold meant the goldest of gold, the, the purest of gold, the best of gold, the, uh, the finest, the most. There's another place in, 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 in the Old Testament where, where it talks about a pit, but it doesn't describe it as just a pit. It says pit, pit. And that's for emphasis, which means it's the pittiest of pits, okay? It's, it's like super pit. And that's what they're describing. But here, here, get this. In, in, in this passage right here, it's very, very rarely ever used. And here it's used three times, which means it's not important or even more important, but it's of the utmost importance. It's, it's, it's beyond what you and I could ever think or hope or imagine. God's superiority and who he is and all that he is, and they go, holy, holy, holy. This is who we're talking about. This is who they sing praises about all day, every day. They give him his due and his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices, here it is, shook the temple to its foundations. Isaiah thinks he's just going to church that day. Isn't it funny that the last person he expects to meet at church is God? Hey, he expects to meet his neighbors, his friends, his families. That's why you go to church. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. And he, instead, he, God shows up. God shows up. And it shakes the place to its foundations. The entire building was filled with smoke. And then he responds with this. It's all over for me. It's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. You see, before this, he thought very highly of himself, as most of us would if we were in his position in that day and that time and we had all those same credentials. And now he finds himself on the floor going, I'm doomed, man. It's over for me. I am sinful and I live with sinful people. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. It's then one of the seraphim flew to me, he says, with a burning coal he had taken from the altar, a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. He says, I'm done, I'm over. He's at this point of, it's no good for me, I'm doomed. This point of confession, at the point of confession... God's very glory touches him, touches him, and his guilt's removed, his sin is forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And he's going, me, please, me, pick me, choose me. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. It, nothing else matters anymore. 
because I've seen God. I'll go, I'll do, I'll be, whatever. He said, here am I, send me, send me. Do, do you see why, why I'm warning you that, that the presence of God, the fear of God has the ability to completely wreck your life as you know it? And that's why I ask again, has it for you yet gone from concept, my neat little God that fits neat in my life just how I want, to reality, completely out of control, out of my control? Concept to reality, the fear of the Lord. You can ask yourself that question over and over as we go through these things because this really is, this is these are things that, that identify whether or not he is a reality in my life. Whether or not he, he's real versus just that concept. And so we'll go through several of these and we see this played out in this moment, in this encounter that Isaiah has with, with God. The first one I want you to write down is simply this, number one. The fear of the Lord defeats my fears in life. The fear of the Lord defeats my fears in life. Now, real quick, let me, let me challenge you. Think of, think of some fears from this last week. Can you think of any, things, any fear that you had this last week? Any of those things? Or how about this? Uh, two, what, was it two Sundays ago? Two Sundays ago, I, I, had, uh, I started, uh, started naming fears, and I had people raising their hands according to if you have this fear or not. Um, one of the fears, let's see, I, I said, how many of you have the fear of failure? And some people raised their hand. I said, how many of you have the fear of loneliness? And some people raised their hand. How many of you have the fear of, and we just went on and on, all these different uh, rejections, and people uh, uh, raised their hands. And it was interesting to me because by far the, the fear that I asked about that the most people raised their hand on was how many of you have the fear, um, have, have, have the fear uh, for your kids? And so many hands went up there. Fear for my kids. That's something I fear about every day. So all these fears that we have in our life. But now, what in this world would cause those fears to disappear, to be defeated, to go away? The answer is the fear of the Lord. It's the fear of the Lord and only that fear that really causes all the other fears to go away. Which is why I'm challenging you today that this is the one fear that you need more of, the fear of God. How does that work? How does that happen? And can it really happen for me? Can it really happen for you? I do believe it can. Let me ask this. How many of you have had some fears going on in your life, worried about a lot of different things, and then suddenly this one really big fear comes in and all the others don't even matter anymore? You ever have that, huh? Yeah, sure you have. It's, um, maybe it plays like this. Maybe it's a... Uh, I'm afraid that I can't pay this bill. Um, that's one fear. I'm afraid that um, my job's not secure. Maybe that's this fear. Um, I'm afraid that uh, this situation with my kids not going to work out. Maybe that's another fear. Uh, all these different fears. And then suddenly the doctor calls and says, there's something on your skin. I need you to come in and talk about it with me. Boom. All those others disappear, don't they? That's not a big deal. That's not such a big deal anymore because now I have this. The same way, the same way, in the presence of the Almighty God, the fear of the Lord, when you are in His presence, it all has to flee and go away and disappear because He is Lord of it all. Because He is Lord of it all. Proverbs 19.23, the fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. Let me ask, have you ever stayed up at night because of your fears? But the fear of the Lord chases that away. I, uh, I remember when I was just a little kid, my mom, you ready for this? My mom... It was not my choice. It was not my decision. My mom drug me through a haunted house. <laughs> and I was not happy about it. No, she pulled me through that thing and I went kicking and screaming through the whole thing. I was absolutely terrified, absolutely scared to death. 
Really, I was hanging all over her the best that I could. My, my nails were digging into her arms every step of the way. When I got out of that haunted house, you know what I said? I will never, ever go to another haunted house again. Until. A few years later, somebody came to me and they said, how would you like to work in a haunted house? Said, what are you talking about, work in a haunted house? Yeah, work in a haunted house. We put on this haunted house, and we need some people who will help out and, 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 and jump out and scare people. I said, wait a second now. Instead of me being the one who's getting scared, I get to do the scaring. They said, yeah. I said, I'm in. I'm in. Let's do that. And so what that allowed me to do was, was to be able to go behind and see all the behind the scenes of the haunted house. And you know what I found when I saw all the behind the scenes of the haunted house? There really was nothing to be afraid of in the first place. The fear of God, get this, the fear of God, that reality, that encounter with God, gives you a glimpse of all of eternity with him. All of eternity to one day, you're you're behind the scenes and you're looking back and going, I can't believe we were so afraid of death. I can't believe we were so worried about that and this and this and all these things that have us so worked up here today. No, no. Our fears are obliterated in the presence of God. It's called the fear of the Lord. It's called the fear of the Lord. Number two. The fear of the Lord not only defeats my fears, but number two, the fear of the Lord destroys my pride in life. It defeats my fears in life, but it also destroys my pride in life. Now, real quick, I want you to do something. I want you to think of of some of your accomplishments, okay? I want you to think of some of the things that people have looked at you and said, well, you should be proud about that. I want you to think of some of those things that that you kind of hang your hat on. Some of those things in your life that you're like, well, you know what? At least I'm not like that person. Some of those things where you can go, well, I'm better at them than that. At least I have this. Or at least I don't think like that. Or at least I don't vote like that. Or at least I don't. I want you to think of all the different things that you and I, we say that we have. I'm from this family. I'm from this town. I'm from this whatever. All those things that we think about ourselves. And then imagine, imagine the presence of the Lord, what all that really amounts to. in the presence of Almighty God. Do you you see why I'm saying um, this reality with God will wreck your world? It wrecks everything about us. So we we get so caught up and so tied up in who we are, and and, and we we, we work so hard to make ourselves feel better by, if, if at least I can say this about me and I'm not like you, or I never did that and I've done this, or maybe I'm more spiritual than you because I... And we, do, we get so tied up and caught up in that. And the truth about it is, the reality when we are faced with God himself, we're just like Isaiah saying, it's over for me. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Not only am I nothing, you're nothing, you're nothing, none of us are anything. It's what he says. We're all doomed. We're all doomed. But, but see, that's where, that's where we go back to it. A lot of people right there go, I think I'll choose the concept. I think I'd rather choose the concept. The reality is too frightening. You see, if I choose the concept of God, then I can decide um, who God is for me and what I want him or expect him to do for me. My, my, the God that I choose, the, the concept, I can fit neatly into my pocket and I can pull, a, pull him out whenever I need him to do something and he'll do it for me. That's the kind of God that I love and that's the kind of God that I serve. It's that concept of a God, not God. And it's our pride that tells us we can do just that. But you see, the reality of God, it obliterates our pride, destroys our pride. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this. How many of you um, have ever been used by somebody? Raise your hand. Have you ever been used by somebody? Oh, that hurts, doesn't it? That hurts. 
Used by somebody, absolutely. Maybe, maybe somebody said, I want, to be your, I want to be your friend, and you're like, okay, you can be my friend, and we're friends, and, and after a little while you found out they only really wanted to be your friend because they wanted you to uh, give them this or do this or it was for something else, not you. Have you ever thought, have you ever thought that for so many of us that sums up our relationship with God? You're my God as long as you do this for me. You're my God because I know, I know that you have a lot of blessings up there somewhere, and you're the one who doles out the blessings, and as long as you're doling out blessings for me, then you're my God. But the second, the second you don't give me the blessing that I'm telling you, you better give me, then I'm done with you, and I'm going to go find another God that fits my world and my life better. Have you ever, you ever had somebody say, you know what, I tried, I tried this, and I tried church, and I tried all these different things, but you know what, I'm kind of done with God. It just never really worked out for me. You ever hear that? You know what they left? They didn't leave God. They left their concept of God. They left a con- their concept of God. Sometimes we, we, we treat God like an appliance in our kitchen. You know what I mean by that? Like our refrigerator. I have this refrigerator, and you're here to give me cold milk. And every day I'm going to come, and I'm going to reach in. I'm, I expect my cold milk. But if I come one day and I open it up and I don't get my cold milk, then you're out of here. i got to replace you and find one that gives me cold milk. Do do, do you see the arrogance in that? When we do the same with God, God, I prayed about this and, and you're supposed to do this. I expected you to do this. God, I wanted you to do this for me and you're, you're supposed to do this for me and this for me rather than that real, true relationship in the presence of God and who he is, being awed by him. You see, uh, this reality of God destroys my pride. I realize I deserve nothing. I realize I deserve death. I think Isaiah right here, as, as that fire starts to come towards him, he's thinking, that's it, man. I'm going to be fried. I'm about to be fried. There's no room for pride, but oh man, we get, we get so, so wrapped up in us and ourselves and who we are so easily. It's as if we, we really do think the world revolves around us. That's what pride does. It's so very deceitful. Just a couple of days ago, um, I, uh, I was driving in the car with Kim, and as we're driving down the road, she said something, and, and it just kind of made me swell up a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh, here's what she says. We're driving down the road in, in the car, and she goes, oh, I just can't wait till Sunday. Uh, that's, that's kind of a cool statement, isn't it? That's all right. Yeah, I mean, she's probably saying she can't wait to hear my most excellent sermon. <laughs> that's what it is. It's, it's, she's excited about the, the, the sermon that, that her husband's going to give on Sunday, and she can't wait to, to get here. And then she, then she made this statement. She goes, I sure hope they played like they did last week. She wasn't thinking about her husband. She was thinking about the Falcons. Really? Really? But you see how quick in the moment, in a moment, we can make it about ourselves, can't we? In a moment, that's what pride does. It makes it about me. And God says, it's not about you, but it's about me. It says right here, Proverbs 15, 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is Humility. God is not one that we can treat as an appliance in our kitchen. God is not one who fits neatly into our pocket. God is not your co pilot. I don't care what the bumper sticker says. In the presence of God, we are all humbled. It destroys my pride in life. And number three, Not only does it defeat my fears in my life, it destroys my pride in life, but number three, it determines my steps in life. It determines my steps in life. It says Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Real quick, how many of you have ever made some dumb choices in your life? 
Yeah, come on now. All right, if you're not raising your hand, you're probably lying, okay? <laughs> you, we've all made the dumb choices, right? We've done, and, and it started when we were young. It started when we were young. You ever, you ever wonder why you make some of the dumb choices that you make? You know, one of the reasons, I have, I have a theory, one of the reasons we make the dumb choices that we make is because we're more afraid of what other people will think about us than what God thinks about us. We have the fear of man, not so much the fear of the Lord. The fear of man. It, it starts young, doesn't it? You remember, you're on the playground, and there's a bunch of guys around you, and they dare you to do something, and you say, I don't know, and then they, they say, what, are you chicken? And the last thing you want is to be chicken. And so you go ahead and do it because you don't want them to think that you're chicken, and you end up in the hospital. <laughs> and it's there in the hospital, your mom said to you, what in the world were you thinking? And then she follows that with, if everybody jumped off a cliff would, right? Now, the honest answer to that question is, yes, mom. I would jump off a cliff if everybody else did because I wouldn't want them to think less of me. Because why? I fear what men think. I fear what men think. And, and that just, it might change in circumstances as we get a little older, right, right? Might change a little bit here and there. We get a little older and it's, hey man, why don't you try this? I don't really want to try this. I've heard that it's not good to try this. It could hurt me. It could do some damage in my life. But you know what? I'm going to try that just because I want you to like me. I'm afraid of what you will think of me if I don't. Or, or, or maybe it's, maybe it's uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll do whatever he wants, even though I really don't want to do it. I'll do whatever he wants because I want him to think I'm special and to like me. Or uh, we, we move on a little bit, and it's, you know what? I'm, I'm going to buy this car that I absolutely cannot afford because I really am concerned about the person who's driving in traffic next to me who I really don't know and I really don't even care about, that when they see me in this car, maybe they'll think I'm something special. I want them to like me. We're looking for that value. We're looking for that worth. And we're looking through it through the fear of man. And it's a trap every time. Look what it says. One results in good judgment. But Proverbs 29, 5, the fear of man brings a snare. The fear of man brings a snare. But whoever entrusts in the Lord shall be safe. Trusting in the Lord. Fearing the Lord. Caring more about what he thinks rather than what others think shows me then the steps and the choices that, that I make in life. Those that are wise, those that are good, those that are safe, where he leads me. There's a, um, you, you know this guy I'm about to tell you about, and you've probably seen him on the news, you've heard about him, and, uh, and this is one person I would say, you can, you can just look at it, you can tell he does not care what people think. He does not care what man thinks. His name's Tim Tebow. And even just recently, he's playing baseball, and what happens, uh, he's signing autographs over there, and, and some guy has a seizure, and automatically uh, he's leaning over, and he's putting his hand on the guy, and he's praying for the guy right there in the middle of everybody that this guy, that this guy would, be, would be made well. And the media boy, they pick it up. They pick it up, and some of you remember the last time he prayed for a guy on an airplane who was having a heart attack, all the criticism that he got, and what's he doing? He's getting in the way of the medical personnel, and who's, who is he to put his religion on everybody else? And Tim Tebow, you can, they interview him, and you can tell he does not care what everybody thinks. All he does is simply say, you know what? It's a privilege for me to be able to live and serve my Lord. He says that on the news with a smile on his face because he fears God more than he fears man. And so again, is, is he a concept or is he a reality? It determines my steps in life. And then finally, number four, it defines my purpose in life. It defines my purpose in life. Deuteronomy 10, 12, what a, what a great passage of scripture, but let me, let me read it to you. It says right here, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? What does it look like? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God 
It's the beginning. It's the start. That's what it looks like. And, the, and live in a way that pleases Him and love Him and serve Him with all your heart and all your soul. I've been asked over and over and over, what, what, is, what is, how do I know my purpose in life? And so many people have this concept of, uh, of their purpose in life as being maybe like this, uh, this uh, trail, or this, this path, this one particular one, and they can't get off of this way or this way. Or how many of you have ever seen American Ninja Warrior? You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, you got to be real careful and you got to make just the right steps. And if you ever miss along the way, then you fall in the tank and you're done. And a lot of people have that concept of, of, of God's purpose and will for their life. They, 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 they think if I, if I make just the right step and if I ever get off, then it's over and I'm done with it. I, I, I think that's a wrong concept. God's will for your life is not so much a life map as it is a lifestyle. And what God chooses for you and what God wants for you. What's so amazing about all that we just read right here is here is Isaiah. And he's saying, I'm done. I'm finished. There's no hope for me. But God in his great mercy and his love. What happens? The judgment of God. Fire always represents the judgment of God. The judgment of God and God's glory touches the man and it changes everything touches Isaiah and it changes everything he's forgiven he's cleaned he's made whole do you, do you, do you remember another time in, in, in the Bible where the temple shook remember there's another time in the Bible when the temple shook like this it was when Jesus was hanging on the cross the skies blackened out there's a great earthquake. The temple shook, and it shook so much that the veil in the temple that separated God from man was ripped in two from the top to the bottom, allowing this, this communion with God Almighty. This communion with God Almighty without being burned up in his presence. Why? Because the glory of God is that his own son, Jesus Christ, took the wrath, took the judgment that you and I deserve on himself. And when the glory of God, Jesus himself, touches you in your life, that is the reality of God. It goes from concept to reality, and he changes everything in you and about you. Your sin is forgiven, and you have this incredible, you can't even begin to explain it relationship with God Almighty, and that is the fear of God, living in his presence each and every day, and the life that that brings to you. It obliterates the old life, and it takes you to the purpose, the great purpose of God in a new life. It's, it's so hard to put something you can't explain um, or you can't, you just can't explain it into a way that we can understand and explain. Uh, and the best I can do is, is it's, I want you to think of a dance. I want you to think of a dance. When, uh, when, when Madison was just going in middle school, it was announced that there would be a father-daughter dance. And uh, so I said, we're going to do this thing. We're going to go all out and doing this thing. I dressed up. I think I even put a tie on. I don't do that for everybody. And she dressed up in this, this beautiful little Cinderella-looking dress. A little tiny thing. I asked her, I said, will you go to this dance with me? Will you go on a date with me? She said, yes, I would. And we, we even, we, I took her out to a fancy restaurant before we went to the dance. We sat there and we ate together. And then we show up here at the dance in the atrium and they got the lights going and, and the band was over, or the, the DJ was playing some music and, and, uh, and as soon as we got here, her and all of her little friends, they go out on the dance floor and they're dancing all around to all these different songs that they know and, and most of us dads were up leaned against the wall going. But, but then they get to this one point, this one place where they said, all right, now we got a special father-daughter dance. And they play this song that you can't even listen to the song without messing you up forever. Um, I think it's called Cinderella. Yeah. 
And so they start to play this song, and, and, and at that moment, uh, dads go looking for their daughters, and daughters go looking for their dads. And I find Madison, I said, can I have this dance? And she says, yes, yes, you can. And it's kind of like, pick me. Here I am, here I am, pick me. And, 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 and so what happens then, she puts her hand right here, and I put my arm around her, and we start to dance. We start to dance, and, and, and at one point, she leans in, and suddenly I feel this big wet spot where she's been crying. And we danced. We danced, and, and I would lead, and we'd go this way, and then we'd go that way, and and, 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 you know, what just happened is we just spent time enjoying one another. Your father says, who? Can I, have, can I have this moment with you? Can I have this time with you? God and, and, and all that he is and all of his glory comes to you. And says, I pick you. Now let me lead. All you have to do is lean in and enjoy. Enjoy my presence. That, my friends, is the best way I can describe the fear of God when he takes hold of his child. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him like that? He stepped out of heaven to bring you to himself. Jesus took the judgment on himself to redeem you. If you don't know him like that, call out to him here and now. Right where you sit, say, Jesus, I need you. I, I'm, I'm like Isaiah. I'm, I'm, I'm a wreck. I'm ruined. I'm a mess. I can't help my. I can't save myself. I need you, Jesus. And right now, the best I know how, I'm receiving you as my Savior. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and be my God and my Savior, my best friend. And right there, you begin an eternal relationship with Him that will never ever end. Let him take you from concept to reality. Be amazed. Be amazed that the God of the universe wants that moment with you. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you so much for saving us through your son, Jesus Christ, and the life that we have because of what he did on the cross. Have your way with us. Open our eyes so we continue to, to see and move towards you and your presence each and every day with us. Everything changes, and we're good with that. You've got us. It's all that matters. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Bo, give Pastor Bo a hand for a great message today. I've got a couple questions.